What's the cost of your own slavery? Cities of the world wide whipped into the street. The best slide of hand we've ever seen. We sleep to be taught and we're taught by the dreams. Good evening and welcome to the final episode in this series of the Live Register. Tonight we look at the situation facing refugees seeking asylum in Ireland. We speak to people about their experience within the direct provision system and hear from a new organisation that is calling an end to deportations. First up, we speak to someone who is involved in the asylum process. I'm joined now by Fennel Fommel who has been through the, and continuing to be through the, the asylum process in Ireland. Could you tell us a little bit about that funnel or how long has that been? Or? Yeah, um, I've been in the system now for seven years, mm -hmm. and I'm in the High Court for the past three years. Okay. And the case, every time it's called up, it's only a join, a join. And um, it got to an extent where um, I was so worried because um, the, the, there's only one judge, as mm -hmm. I was made to understand, for all asylum applications in the High Court. Okay. And this sitting is only, I think, um, thrice a year. Mm -hmm. So last year in December, when they were going on holidays, I was on the list as uh, number 65. Yeah. And because the judge calls um, 65 or above that cases mm -hmm. in every sitting, I knew that at the beginning of this year, I will be among the first. Okay, so yeah. when we got to the court, I realized I wasn't even called up. And then when I went to check the list, I found out that I had dropped back to number 298. Okay. So I was so worried. I was so disturbed because, you know, you can't live for, in limbo for so long. Mm -hmm. I've left my family back home. And um, so I decided to write to the judge myself. Mm -hmm. I asked for his, uh, his full names. I wrote to him. I said, he said, it is first come, first serve. Last, before you went on the judicial holiday, I was mm -hmm. this number, and you came back, I dropped. Yeah. To the, he told me that I dropped because they were emergency cases. Okay, yeah. Like the children, like the parents of, when the, the Zambrano law came. Mm -hmm. So the parents of the, chil the, parents of the uh, children that were supposed to be deported, mm -hmm. so they had to consider their own case because they were children, like yeah, priority yeah. cases. So I asked him the question again. I said, okay, in every country around the world, there are always priority cases. Yeah. And if these priority cases keep coming on, it means there will never be a hearing to my case. Mm -hmm. over, over the period, actually, of the seven years, I mean, have you been based in, in one place in Dublin or where, where have you been? Or what's your, I have, your experience been like? Yeah, the experience is so bad. The experience is so bad that sometimes I, I ask myself, are we in Europe or mm -hmm. we are somewhere in the jungle? Because yeah. I, I came here, I was in the, I was in the, in the Basesi Centre. I was moved to Tramor, that is in Kato, uh, County um, Waterford. Waterford. Mm -hmm. Then I was moved back to Waterford City. Then I was moved to Cork. I was moved to Limerick. And you know what happened when we demonstrated? And I was moved from Limerick back to Dublin. And th that's a lot of moves over, over a period of time. Is there any kind of, like in your own experience, any kind of consultation about where this direct provision is going to be provided for you? Are you asked, do you want to move here, or is this kind of a forced move? Or? No, you see, uh, that's why I'm saying that I don't know if we're living in a jungle or we're really living in Europe, because I believe, uh, like African countries, they'll look onto Europe, that this is where democracy is coming from, this mm -hmm. is where human rights is. Yeah. Like I'm telling you, I'm a graduate from the International Institute for Human Rights in Strasbourg, in France. Mm -hmm. So I really know what this human rights stuff I'm talking yeah. about comes from. The Europeans are the ones that they pretend to give us the knowledge. Mm -hmm. They brought in the human rights studies yeah. into existence. They are the ones trying to promote this. But when you come to, uh, to our own situation in Ireland, I feel that there is no, there is no human right. Mm -hmm. Because when they talk of human rights, if you, if you read the, the human rights law or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, yeah. they don't talk of if you are a European, they said every human being has a yeah. right to decide where to live. The 
direct provision system was introduced in 2000 as a policy response to a sudden upsurge in refugee applications to the state. Under direct provision, asylum seekers are housed in shared accommodation centres around the country. They are provided meals and are given a weekly stipend of €19.10. They are not allowed to work during the asylum process, which can last for several years. The vast majority of direct provision centres are run by private companies. Of the 60 accommodation centres in Ireland, only seven are state-owned and all are privately operated. The Reception and Integration Agency was set up in the Department of Justice in 2001 to oversee these private contractors. Between 2003 and 2009, the RIA paid the contractors an average of 83 million euros each year. Behind me is Hatch Hall in Dublin, one of the private direct provision centres. Hatch Hall is owned by a company called East Coast Catering, a Canadian company founded by Dundalk émigré Patrick O'Callaghan. It specialises in accommodation for the oil and gas industry. It is difficult to establish how much the company has been paid by the state for direct provision, but a report in 2006 estimates it's something around 15 million. According to a 2010 RIA document, privatised direct provision has worked out cheaper for the state. The report concludes that providing food, board and a small stipend for asylum seekers is cheaper than providing social welfare and rent supplement so that the applicants can house themselves. What so many Irish taxpayers don't understand mm -hmm. is that they are saying they give asylum seekers 19 euro. No, it is 19 euro that asylum seekers collect. What yeah. they give asylum seekers is a complete social welfare allowance that they okay, give yeah. any other um, Irish person who is under the social welfare allowance. Mm -hmm. So you go to the post office, yeah. you sign with a complete amount like, let's say, about two years ago when the social welfare was 209 mm -hmm. euros. You go there on your receipt, your social welfare receipt at the post office is 209 euros. Then they'll tell you they have deducted means to. Then they only give you 19 euros. And this means to, you don't know who that means goes to. So every asylum seeker collects his complete, no, uh, signs for his complete social welfare allowance. Yeah. But the post office hands to him or her 19 euros. So essentially on the book somewhere, this payment you have signed for is, is the normal social welfare payment, but actually what you receive in your hand is, is 19 that, euros, 10, you 10, that, 10 cent. Well, exactly what you, yeah. you receive. These uh, private providers or businessmen, as mm -hmm. they call them, who provide hostel services, they are like a semi-god. Even the, something like a toothpaste, they will ask you to go and get a toothpaste, which is the government has paid for it. It yeah. is your right to go and get it. Yeah. When you get there, you need to like, kneel down and be pleading, please, can I have toothpaste? Sure. You need not say, give me toothpaste, or my toothpaste is finished. No, they say you are rude. There's a, there's a power dynamic there, I guess, mm. in, the, in this sense. Yeah, so, and if you ask that question, what happens is they will just move you sure. from that hostel to another hostel, and it's the same thing, the same yeah, people, yeah. The, same, the same group. We contacted the RIA, who put us in touch with the Department of Justice. We submitted questions to them in writing, but unfortunately, the department told us they would be unable to provide answers in time for our broadcast. When you come here as an asylum seeker, your own case is different. Yeah. You don't have a voice, you don't have a right. I think mm -hmm. animals are even better treated in Ireland than human beings, than asylum seekers. Yeah. Because the way they treat asylum seekers, you don't have a voice, you cannot talk, you don't ask questions. Do you know why I was being moved from all these places? It's because I asked questions. Yeah. And whenever I ask a question, I have a problem with the manager. And the next thing is, the manager writes a report to RIA, which is a social integration agency of the Department of Justice. Yeah. They only listen to the manager, they don't listen to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you spoke um, before, I guess, about the sort of, the Department of Justice actually got in contact with you after the, some organizing in Limerick about the conditions under direct provision. Um, I mean, it seems that actually to, to, to begin to raise a voice and to begin to talk about the experiences of people under direct provision tends to get you in trouble with that very system itself. Of course, um, of course, certainly. And that is why so many people don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. It has been very tough, you know, being a single mother, going through difficulties and, you know, by the way, because I really didn't plan to come to Ireland, it happened that I'm in Ireland, you know, and 
the the particular person that have brought me to Ireland is the one who kind of, you know, blew my mind away by the promises of Europe and all that. And I kind of trusted the person and I didn't know it will end up the way it is. It's hard, you know, it is hard because we are different people from different uh, countries. We may all look black, but I mean, others are from Nigeria, others are from different, we are all from different countries, different background. Our beliefs are different. Our Everything is different, you know, so it's difficult for me to tell you that I am close to more than 10 people. You know, we are living in this Europe with modern life and everything totally different from where we come from. And for our kids, it's just like hell. Really, it's very difficult for them because especially those who go to school who are interacting with those uh, um, Irish kids, you know, they see their lifestyle is totally different. And in schools, you know, though the kids are given all this child um, back to school allowance, mm -hmm. which is really not enough for us who are not working, you know, and then the school every time or almost every day, the child will be coming with a letter expecting parents to pay two euro, three euro for this and that, you know, and all kids will want to be part of any activity. They don't want to be left out because they don't want to feel like, oh, I'm different. My mom couldn't give me this money and feel miserable there, you know, but it is really hard for kids. I'm just, I just want to give you an insight of how my living conditions under direct provision is. It's two families sharing a room. I've got a two-year-old daughter. My roommate has a five-year-old son. We live in the same room. We share a toilet and this five-year-old, he's growing and I don't think that that's how people should live in a first world country, in Europe, in Ireland, in this day and age. Like, it, it's, it's, it's unheard of. I think it shouldn't be. He's five. We share the same room. How am I supposed to have my privacy? How am I supposed to dress? How am I supposed to do anything with him there in the room? Usually when I watch TV and I see people talking about their problems, you know, when grown-ups, grown Dr. Phil, they always say, let's talk about your childhood. They always refer back to the childhood. The childhood of our children is being contaminated because they, we are sexualizing our, our, our children. In a family where there's a father, mother, child living in one room, they have to have their, their intimates, intimate time in front of the children. What, do, what are you teaching that child? My daughter, for example, is, I would say she's angry, she's two. Every time I take her out of the hostel, she's happy to go. The minute we come back, she says, I don't want to go there. If she's that angry, how about me? I used to be a productive person in my society, and I can still be productive in this country. But because I've stayed in the system for two and a half years, my mind is dormant. I'm not allowed to work. I'm not allowed to go to school. And then suppose I'm lucky after eight years being in the system, yeah. then I'm given leave to remain. Suppose like, if I'm not deported, six years, they give me leave, uh, leave to remain. They expect me to be productive again. Having kept me in one place for six years, it doesn't work. This direct provision doesn't work. What impact do you think the, the restriction on people's ability to actually work um, has on people in, in the process of, of waiting for claims to come through? Um, um. The impact, uh, they are in twofold. Mm -hmm. One, the health yeah. of the people. Since I came into this country, I think I've lost three friends yeah. that who have died like this, suffering from one, started like a joke from one mental disorder to yeah. this, to that, and finally they are gone. And then I have Many more say who are not who are sick. When you look yeah. at them, they'll be talking as you and I are talking, but they are sick yeah. mentally because they are no more normal to themselves. Yeah. They say things that you know that oh, when we were here in 2005, it wasn't like this. You know yeah. that you've got the, 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 they are gone. I'm fully healthy and well, and I know very well that I can participate very well in my community. You know, so as for me being here and not working for the past six years, I just feel like it is just a waste of resources because I know what I care, you know, and I know what I can deliver out there, you know. So, but again, at the, this point, I don't really think that I'm pitying myself. I'm pitying the government of Ireland 
because I believe that I know that I'm not, not be that kind of, but I believe what I can give to them, it can open their eyes somehow. I usually, if I want to talk, I will. I usually come with a doll baby. I always use a doll baby to show what it feels like to be an asylum seeker. And usually, I bring the doll baby dressed up, and I show you. It looks so fine. Ah, this is a fine doll. It dressed up, but I usually pull off the clothes. That is like if you can have time, make a friend with an asylum seeker or even a, a migrant, and let the person bear him or herself to you. You will understand what they feel. When I take out the jacket, I show you things like I have, I have like fear, I have like anger. Those are the kind of feelings that goes in among the asylum seekers day in day out. But I always have one on the head, and that is hope, because that is the only thing most asylum seekers cling onto. They have the fear of we don't know what will happen tomorrow. We have the <coughs> anger of why am I here? I mean. It's like you're being in between the devil and the deep blue sea, and you don't know which one to take. It's like sitting on a friends. But the only thing they cling on is hope. Anti-deportation Ireland is uh, an outcome of the Anti-Racism Network, which is, uh, of course, an anti-racist organization active in Ireland. And um, the last year, there were some uh, protests in asylum seeker centers, and um, and the anti-racism network was contacted by people who organized those protests. And um, ourselves, some of us, uh, as a means of doing some militant research, uh, visited those centers and spoke with the people, trying to understand wh which were uh, their motivations for, for the protest and what they wanted. As it was in the past years, the issue of deportation, there was so much veil, like his secrets. There's so much secrets in the issue of deportation. Even among the civil servants, they're not even, even among themselves, they don't know if some they say, even they don't even know, even politicians, they don't even know. And um, it was only individuals when one is being deported, when you know because it's a friend or someone you know. And uh, there were very few activists as well. There was like a, one group here in Dublin, Residents Against Racism, Rosanna Flynn, and there was in, in Cork, uh, Jomo with the Cork Anti-Racism Network. They were like the ones who were in forefront about anti-deportation. But we have like loads of NGOs, I'm talking more than 50, but it is something, a, a topic that they don't really articulate or speak out publicly about. We can talk about undocumented, but they don't go as far as against deportations. On the demand is to put an end to our deportations. Um, it's the one issue that all the other groups campaigning with and for asylum seekers do not mention. Uh, I'll just give one example. On the 20th of June this year, which was World Refugee Day, and various NGOs had held events here in Dublin which were attended by politicians um, amongst whom were Alan Shatter, the Minister for Justice. Earlier that morning, at 5 a.m., roughly, um, members of the GNIB, that's the Guard Immigration Bureau, raided a number of hostels around the country, picking up Nigerian people. There was 18 people deported that day on World Refugee Day. Twelve of them were children, and all of those children were born in Ireland, but because they were born after the 1st of January 2005, they do not qualify for citizenship. Uh, one such case was a woman by the name of um, Adekemi Sarofa in Port Leash. Um, she had, she was here with three children and her youngest son's case was still in the High Court. She tried to argue with the GNIB officers at that hour in the morning who were taking perception of children from the bed about her son's case in the High Court. They didn't listen. She was uh, badly assaulted, she was pepper sprayed and she was taken away in handcuffs with her children. Now I have photographs of that here, but haven't been talking to her since. She doesn't want these to be circulated. She doesn't want them on the uh, internet, etc. But I can pass them around on condition that I get them back. And it clearly shows the woman being taken. Her stomach bleeding from um, an unhealed scar. She had a recent um, operation on her stomach. I've seen these kids crying and this men putting on those heavy bulletproof uniform like they came to fight or to remove any bomb somewhere 
it is just heartbreaking you know because who really want to be treated like that who really want to be treated i mean how inhuman and ruthless those people are during that time they don't have any heart they don't feel for anyone they don't care you understand and then you are just standing there you are looking like you are helpless and hopeless you can't do anything you can't you know you are just standing there also probably waiting for your own time you know just trying to even get a glimpse of okay when my own time come how will i behave when this happens that is even one of the things that really during that time we are also kind of uh, reflecting on i i know of people who sit up at night just to listen out to see if around two o'clock three o'clock if there's someone coming to take them every day they live in fear you don't know what's going to happen to you tomorrow it's it's a direct provision actually it's worse than being in prison in prison at least you know i've been sentenced five years after five years i'll come out there you don't know it could be two years three years ten years the most so you're constantly living in fear people are are under a lot of stress people are on antidepressants people are afraid asylum seekers like me some of them are even afraid to come out and tell you what their stories are because they don't know if i talk maybe they'll come and take me tomorrow it is a very emotional time a lot of people are crying and then from there you are remain you are traumatized and no one cares about you from there you know it's none of their business they are here they are feeding you they are giving you so shut up and eat and get fat and get out of their country that's what they are talking that's exactly what they are portraying showing us you know it is one of the most stressful part of the whole direct provision we are talking about direct provision but the idea of direct provision it made it easy for the state to deport people because like uh, what one academic uh, dr ronit says it's uh, it makes people deportable it puts them at a, at a, you know in the places where they could be unlike in other countries you know like you look in italy france and others people you can go and block in ireland you can't do that because of the way it has been uh, it is operated so time after time we we were only reporting like texting oh so and so has been deported then discover that no when you talk to your friends at college at work and other places they said we don't know is this happening here so we thought that okay there's a need to remove the veil to remove the cover on deportations people have to know what is happening Do, do you think that most ordinary Irish people, um, do you think they're aware of the conditions that asylum seekers live under? I think not, not many people. There are people who are aware, of course, but uh, most of the people are not. And this is for various reasons. One reason is because uh, mainstream media tend not to uh, deal with this topic. Mm -hmm. It's something that doesn't appear on TV or on journals. Of course, there are groups like us that are campaigning and that uh, um, speak about this uh, in social networks or through their websites and blogs, mm -hmm. but this is not enough. Uh, and then um, this issue is not also known by, by locals because, uh, as I said, asylum seeker centers tend to be uh, in really remote area and mm -hmm. tend to be excluded. And deportation, the main reason, it is to make sure that this issue, it is no longer an individual issue. It's no longer a secret, it's no longer a private, but it is a national problem. What we are hoping to do is build a network uh, of all these hostels around the country uh, that would be able to, people to represent themselves in the first instance, and I must apologize, <laughs> being a white Irish guy, you know, and, and that's normally what appears speaking on behalf of asylum seekers as white professional Irish people. I'm not that, but still it's wrong that I should be here. That campaign of anti-deportation Ireland, it is one which is to be led by people themselves who are facing deportation, themselves who are living in the direct provision, themselves who are in immediate danger. And um, at the last minutes of before the launch, it's, it's specified that supporters and friends and others they won't be leading anti-deportation so if it fails it's not because friends and supporters failed no it is that the people themselves who are in the system 
a failed to sustain it in a way of leading because time after time people that are living maybe four five years in the system as soon they get their status they have a life to, to catch up so you can't expect them to come and sustain the movement no they have to go and catch up on the life so those who are arriving are the ones who should keep on keep the oxygen and energy in the movement i i was so happy when i when i i head of the creation of anti-deportation groups and anti-racism and all these other organizations are coming up but my problem here is the functionality and the reality of it is what i don't see mm -hmm. why i don't see this is because most of these organizations are not being headed by the irish so it doesn't have an impact okay yeah they say, oh, they are the same people. You know, we are, we yeah. are already integrating the society. Mm -hmm. And we know how, we know, like for instance, I know how an Irish person will react to a situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, anti-deportation, who is that? Alexander, where is he from? Oh, my Moro, ah. They are, they are the same people. Yeah. Got the fuck? You know? Yeah, yeah. So, it will come to a time when the Irish people themselves, because we are already integrating, it will come to a time when the Irish people themselves will stand up and say, these people are our brothers. These people are human beings. They should be treated fairly. And yeah. they get the, the banner, they get the placard, they go forward and mm -hmm. they lead the demonstration. That's where you have an impact. Yeah. For me, yeah, I don't yeah, know how yeah. others yeah. would think. For me, that's what I look for. I already understand the society, how it functions. Yeah. Because the hostel we are living in, a woman living in a small room with four children and all that stuff. Yeah. If it was an Irish person living there, I just probably have been on the streets. Our children are the future of Ireland. Most of the children in direct provision are going to end up living in Ireland anyway. But they've got so many problems. We are looking at a future where we will be dealing with cycles because of the root, where, of the, because of their childhood. Ireland is building something that in the next 20 or 30 years will come back to haunt them. Yeah. And bear me witness, this interview I'm giving, sometime, someday you will say, somebody said something. They are building something because you see they said people learn from mistakes. Yeah. If you don't learn from your own mistakes, you can learn from the mistakes of all others. Yeah. Ireland is a member of the EU. They would have seen the trouble Britain is going through now. Mm -hmm. With that system of segregation they made some years back, how it's haunting them now. Yeah. With street children, delinquent children. France has the same problem. Mm -hmm. So Ireland would have said, oh, this, what these people did, they made some mistake because Britain is trying to correct that now. Yeah. But it's late because something they created themselves. Yeah. And Ireland is still falling in that same trap of trying to create some, some type of social class, not yeah. people. Those children are there, they are growing up. In the next 20, 30 years, there will be those two that start coming up to mm -hmm. participate in the Irish economy. So, what, are, what do they think the next 30 years is going to bring to them when they create this type of? social dis I call it social disorder. As we can see, this is a very complex issue. And unfortunately, we're only able to scratch the surface of it in a half hour program. Now, the Department of Justice were unable to get back to us in time for our broadcast. So unfortunately, their voices couldn't be featured in the program. And that's it for the opening series of the Live Register. We hope to return in the new year. Thanks to all our viewers for your support. What's the cost of your own slavery?